Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Puget Sound <clears throat> passenger only ferry study. My name is Kalon Thomas and I'm assistant planner here at PSRC. Before we get started, we just wanted to kind of go through a few of the meeting procedures. Um, today will be a listen only webinar. So we'd kindly ask that you please use the chat feature for any questions or comments. Um, please do not use the, the raise your hand feature. Questions are gonna be placed in a queue for staff to read and provide answers to at appropriate times throughout the webinar, as well as a longer QA session at the very end. Comments and feedback will be provided in chat, um, will be sent to the project team after the webinar, but we generally won't be reading those out. Alternatively, you can send questions, comments, and feedback to the project email address, which is POF underscore study, which will be on screen at the end of the webinar as well. For, que for any questions that we are unable to get to today, um, we will follow up after the webinar. As always, this and previous webinars in the series will be posted on the PSRC website after, after today's webinar. Joining me today will be Gil Cerise, PSRC's Program Manager in Transportation, as well as Kristen Kissinger, Project Manager uh, at KPP KPFF Consulting Engineers. And with that, I'll hand things over to Gil. Thank you, Kalon. Can you hear me, just to make sure? Yep, can hear you loud and Great. clear. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, welcome to our third and final uh, public webinar for the uh, Puget Sound Passenger Only Ferry Study. Uh, I'm going to encourage you all to, uh, we're not gonna get too much into a background or, uh, or past information. We've had two previous webinars. So if you wanna know more about the background, some of the background information or some of the previous analysis, I encourage you to come to our uh, Puget Sound Passenger Only Ferry uh, Study website to look at that but I will give a brief uh, introduction to this in terms of the scope of the project to say that uh, in 2008, PSRC did a uh, passenger only ferry study following on the state legislature uh, taking the state out of passenger only ferry business, uh, calling passenger only ferries a form of public transportation that should be uh, run and operated by locals similar to other forms of public transportation. In 2008, PSRC did a study focused on our four counties, King, Kitsap, Pearson, and Homish counties, and uh, the, we identified near and long-term opportunities for passenger only ferries. The uh, near-term opportunities are all being, or all have been implemented, or in one case, uh, Southworth to downtown Seattle route is going to be implemented here in the in the near future. So those that's kind of one of the successes of the study we did in the past. Uh, in, uh, fast forward to 2019, and uh, the legislature gave PSRC funding to uh, update that study. The slide shows uh, many of the features that are identified in the study, looking at things like passenger demand and ridership, uh, terminal locations and capacity, looking at costs, whether they be at capital or operating costs. Lots of updates to the kind of information we looked at in 2008, but it expanded the scope and geography. So we're looking at a full 12 counties that touch on Puget Sound, as well as Lake Washington and Lake Union. We also uh, were asked to look at some uh, assessing some environmental conditions such as emissions and electrification. So that's also inclu included in this study. So it's a very uh, uh, um, broad study area, a very um, uh, complex uh, topic to talk about. So uh, at this point, I wanted to kind of uh, also talk about, uh, as be, uh, before we get into uh, further, uh, without further ado, I also want to introduce the, the um, consultant team on the right-hand side of the slide here. Uh, as uh, Kaylin mentioned, it's uh, headed up by KPFF. Kristen Kissinger is the project manager from KPFF. And the list of sub-consultants that are working with us are, are shown uh, to the right there. And uh, they, this is the consulting team we hired to provide the technical uh, um, expertise for the study. Uh, KPFF and their team are experts both locally and nationally on ferries and passenger only ferries. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of provide a few uh, words about the study and what, uh, and, and, uh, what we really learned early on was that uh, this study does uh, have a lot of expectations around it. So we wanted to really be clear about what it is and what it is not. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to make sure this is a study that's very neutral and fact-based study about passenger only ferries. We didn't want it to be overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. We wanted to have a study that has some credibility for a, for a planning and feasibility study that, such as it is. It also is a planning and feasibility study, not an implementation study. So we always have been getting, uh, in the past engagement series we've had, we've been getting uh, uh, questions and feedback about how are we addressing um, uh, implementation aspects. Uh, we aren't really. This is, again, kind of a high-level planning and fe uh, feasibility study, and it's up to local entities that are uh, identified as potential implementers, whether it be a transit agency, a port, a, a city, or a local jurisdiction, to be able to work together to do uh, work in implementing this uh, study. Um, the study does provide some good information that can be used and helped uh, advance passenger only ferries where it makes sense. In addition, the study covers a large and diverse geographic area. So 
As you can see on the left-hand side here uh, is an illustration of the study area, 12 counties within uh, uh, the touch on Puget Sound. It does not go beyond that. Uh, we did have some early comments uh, on, on whether or not we're looking at connections to Victoria or Vancouver, BC. We're not going outside the study area. In addition, it is a uh, very large and complex uh, area. It, uh, it, it's not statewide, but at the same time, it covers 12 counties, six regional transportation planning organizations or RTPOs, there's 13 transit agencies and, and uh, many uh, ports, cities, tribes, and others that are within this study area. So um, it does create a complex uh, environment within which to implement and, and run a uh, passenger-only ferry service, yet the study does not get into governance or funding aspects. Uh, um, that's something that's outside of the scope of the study. And uh, I, think that, I, I think that covers the expectations. Uh, uh, and and uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So this slide shows the uh, project schedule for the passenger only ferry study and uh, the elements of the study itself. Um, as noted in the last slide, that, I think that last uh, bullet was on uh, engagement and at calling for uh, continuous engagement throughout the process. So I wanted to touch on the engagement, uh, stakeholder engagement on the, on the lower bar here first. Um, we started off in late 2019, reaching out to different organizations throughout the uh, 12 county study area. We ended up touching on or representing to organizations that covered each of those uh, 12 uh, counties that, that participated in there, whether it be the Peninsula RTPO, North Sound Transportation Alliance. We had some, uh, some countywide groups and some uh, sub areas and some cities and things like that. Uh, we, in that initial effort, let people know about the study. We talked to them about what kind of studies and, and, and plans are out there and, and able to gather some resources for us to uh, include in the study. We all, uh, our executive director, Josh Brown, sent letters to tribal leaders from 22 tribes within the study area. So we were able to uh, engage the tribes early on and let them know about the study and invite their participation and, and collaboration in the study. Uh, we also used an email distribution list of over 3,000 email uh, subscribers to and other social media um, um, resources that PSRC has to kind of let people know about the study, uh, to get the word out. And, uh, and we also then kind of collaborated and worked with our uh, six regional transportation planning organizations or RTPOs and San Juan County uh, also, uh, who is not a part of an RTPO. And we worked with them to, uh, uh, throughout the project, you can see the, uh, the the diamonds on the study uh, on the uh, the line there that show how we met with them and we worked with them in between uh, meetings to kind of keep the study rolling and they are the experts from outside of our region we we figured that we as PSOC of four county region needed the help of those RTPO partners to help in those areas. We also ended up you know, recruiting the stakeholder and uh, database has been an, a growing, uh, an ongoing basis. It's been growing throughout the project. We uh, received most of them, I believe, in the springtime, but we've continued to gather people who are uh, interested in being stakeholders. We have almost 400 stakeholders on our database as of uh, uh, last week. And then we had the survey in the springtime and we had 10,000 people respond to that survey. So we've had a pretty robust uh, 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 public engagement throughout this process. And, and just kind of also wanted to note, uh, you can see the, uh, the particular uh, tasks on the, in the study that from existing conditions down to draft and final uh, study. We've been uh, conducting this in public engagement throughout that uh, period. We started at kind of a larger scale landscape uh, uh, of the entire study area for the early parts of the study and, and honed in on some more detail. Again, we couldn't do a detailed route profile for every route within, this, within that 12 county area. So we did look at things and I think Kristen will be talking more about the analysis and how we winnowed down to the routes that we did route profiles on. But when throughout this whole, um, um, process, we engaged with stakeholders as appropriate. And you can see we even had opportunities here to kind of reach out for, for uh, communities that were identified for potential route profiles. Um, and I think that covers it for, for the engagement to date. I will at this point turn it over to Kristen. All right, thank you, Gil. Thanks everybody for being here. I'm going to drive us to the next slide. Here we go. So um, it looks like we have quite a few participants, 110 per my count. So thank you everyone for taking the time to hear about the study. Um, as I believe Gil mentioned, the draft report can be found on the PSRC website. All the information that we're sharing today can be found in the report, including um, the route profiles. So feel free to follow along once we get there if you'd like. Um, but this is really a Cliff Notes version of the plan. So. Um, if you miss anything or want any more detailed information, um, you can definitely refer to that. As far as our agenda for today, um, we're going to be talking about kind of overall study findings, 
And we're going to have these pause for questions kind of trickled throughout because it is such um, a dense amount of information. So um, don't worry if you have questions, we'll make sure to pause for those. If you have them, put them in the chat per Kalon and um, he'll be feeding them to us throughout the session. Um, then we'll go into route profiles and this is where we'll just head on those very detailed routes um, that we had for further analysis. Again, you can follow along with us in the plan. And then the very final section is the next steps for implementation. Okay. So for overall passenger only ferry study findings, we did all this work, what did we learn? Um, and again, we're gonna really be talking about really high level things in the beginning here. And then after we go through the route profiles in more detail, we can go to more um, site specific findings. So really the idea is that there's this overall importance of time competitive travel. It doesn't matter if it's a commute route or a discretionary travel route, people really care about time savings. And so that was very evident through our survey findings. Um, also route characteristics are very specific to the route itself. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the unique marine environment that a POF operates within. Um, route characteristics are different based on which body of water that you're operating in, you know, vessel speeds, whether you're in a confined waterway or a slowdown zone, which is the case in many of these um, routes that we profiled. Um, as far as if you're on the Puget Sound, there's wind action currents. And I know probably there's many of you operators um, that are on this webinar that this is all very obvious to you, but I'm just gonna say it all just for the um, benefit of everyone. And then another thing that really strengthens or, or changes from route to route are the multimodal connections that it observes on the land side. So you can't solve all the problems on the water by operating just right um, it really has to link up to the multimodal connections on the land side. Um, and again, feeding into this unique marine operating environment, you know, there's tribal treaty fishing rights, sensitive habitats, marine mammal protection, um, vessel traffic, U.S. Coast Guard regulators. So there's lots of unique things that set it apart and are very different than operating um, on the roadway. And then um, another overall finding is that POF or passenger only ferries as we abbreviate in this study um, improves overall transportation resiliency. And we find that around the country that in um, places that, uh, that have ferries that it's, it contributes to both response and recovery in an emergent situation, but also transportation resiliency, just having another option that people can use on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so another aspect of this study was electrification. One of the things that we did was look at, you know, what are the current technologies in place and do the specific profiles that are needed to meet time competitive travel make um, any of these particular routes um, kind of a leg up for electrification as it currently stands. And what we found is that for a lot of these routes, the potential for electrification currently is fairly low and that's due to the like long distances of travel and high speeds of which the ferry needs to operate. Um, you know there's really exciting work underway um, with Maritime Blue partnerships and um, different technologies that many um, many folks who attend different ferry conferences and propulsion conferences know that there's lots of alternative powers and battery advancements the size um, are changing all the time. And so that's something that we'll need to be kept an eye on um, in this region as those technologies move forward. And then one big thing, a question that the proviso asked is what, what could be done regionally to move electrification forward? And so thinking about that is really um, comes down to standardization of terminal infrastructure. And this was one element that our team um, really posed is that if there is some more common um, harmonization of utility rates, if an operator knows what to expect for rate costs, um, if vessel charging systems are more um, standardized around the region, then there may be more opportunities for interchange and interplay of those elements. Okay, Gil, I'm gonna turn it over to you for engagement findings. Thank you, Kristen. Um, 
This uh, again kind of summarizes the engagement, uh, pub uh, public engagement findings from the study as a whole. And we'll get into more detail about the uh, different route profile engagement that we in, uh, got into and in the, in the findings we, there. But this is kind of, this, this summarizes what we heard overall throughout the study period. And it, in fact, you can find a, uh, there is an appendix on public engagement as part of our graph study that Kristen mentioned, you can find on our website. Uh, in general, we found a, a a great deal of public interest and enthusiasm for passenger-only ferries. And in that, as that first bullet uh, at the top alludes, there's a lot of potential uh, um, benefits from a passenger-only ferry. And I think a lot, of the, um, a lot of the enthusiasm is in part generated because of the implementation of those routes by King County Metro and Kitsap Transit with the fast ferries and the water taxi, uh, the foot ferries. Uh, they show some examples of things where there's potential time savings. The Bremerton to Seattle uh, route for a uh, fast ferry is about half the time as it takes for a Washington State ferry. Route directness, there's several examples of that. Uh, one example might be uh, Kingston to downtown Seattle where, uh, where you can uh, operate, uh, you can get there um, faster, more direct uh, to downtown Seattle rather than having to transfer. And then there's also aspects about additional um, opportunities for additional modal connections as well as resiliency. And those are also valuable aspects of about a multi, about uh, passenger only ferry as part of a multimodal transportation system. Reactions varied by community. There's a range from strong support uh, on one end to, uh, to communities that express some concerns, uh, particularly uh, kind of in a high level um, a summary about those that express concerns would be related to their community vision or uses for those, their waterfront areas uh, at, that, at that other uh, end of the spectrum. A couple other uh, themes in the public engagement. There was a, a recognition about the uh, uh, multiple purposes that passenger only ferry could serve beyond uh, transporting commuters and others. Uh, there could be uh, aspects, related aspects of tourism and economic development, induced demand that uh, bring people to an, an area that they wouldn't come to if there wasn't passenger only ferry service available. And then lastly, there was a, a, a recognition that each potential route is unique and requires community engagement and, and in, to implement that route. And that's a, kind of you know, a theme throughout this presentation you'll see is that each route, the uniqueness of each route, the importance of planning and being able to get into that detailed route implementation aspect. But uh, it, when we look at this here, there's, there are some cautionary uh, uh, areas uh, that we found, some concerns related to things like specific terminal locations uh, and being make, making sure that you're able to kind of talk, uh, talk through and identify uh, issues and being able to make sure that you find a, a, a terminal location that's community support and, and, and meets other criteria, as well as for passenger only ferry as a form of public transportation, making sure those modal connections are there. Uh, it requires, uh, if, unless you're able to walk to your destination, being able to uh, uh, easily access tra uh, bus transit or other types of transit. And then finally, the uh, ability and availability of parking and, and, and potential impacts of parking on, on that, uh, as, particularly as we talked about earlier, induced demand and, and what does that mean for parking in that area? So those are some of the uh, key themes we heard in the engagement uh, uh, from, from that. With that, next slide, please. Another area that we kind of found that uh, summed up here is it kind of alluded to in that uh, slide on the uh, scope is uh, we're calling these cross-regional findings, just in, in a recognition that uh, the study area has, you know, uh, more than a dozen transit agencies, um, multiple uh, ferry operators, uh, several regions. So it's, it is really kind of a, uh, uh, this, this is an area where it does cross a number of regional and transit district boundaries, and a number of the routes that we looked at did that. So we had a series of findings that kind of fall into this bucket. No matter where you're at, when we're on the Puget Sound region, uh, this, these, these kind of findings would be applicable. In the top left, we're looking at uh, further siting identification and analysis as needed for all the sites in Seattle. So when you count downtown Seattle and the lake routes uh, as a, and the Seattle destinations there, I think almost half of the 45 routes that were studied that Kristen will be talking about shortly have a, have, want to have a destination in Seattle. Um, and I think with the downtown Seattle itself, it's close to 40% of those routes. Uh, so that kind of shows at a high level that the, the interest in passenger only ferry and the interest in passenger only ferry coming to the, to the study area's largest employment area, the largest uh, growth, urban growth center. Uh, so, so that is really important to be able to find a site uh, an ability to find and, and identify site with capacity for passenger only ferry service there. The current downtown Seattle site at Pier 50 is at capacity or close to that. And, uh, and, and Kitsap Transit's already uh, looking at a siting study for downtown Seattle to be able to uh, make sure there's additional capacity for services anticipated. Any new service that's needed would have to find additional capacity downtown Seattle. In addition, the lake routes you'll see when we get into the lake route uh, discussion, uh, there's going to be a need to find a, 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 a route, a, a terminal location for lake routes in, in the Seattle side as well. 
for tribal coordination, uh, that's essential for, for uh, any element of, uh, of the uh, passenger line ferry uh, um, implementation. Coordinating with the tribes uh, will be really important. There's everything from tribal uh, fishing rights that Kristen mentioned in an earlier uh, slide, as well as looking at culturally sensitive shoreline properties or culturally important areas where potential terminals, you know, are looking, looking at potential terminals or other shoreside uh, development opportunities. Uh, in terms of the common marine environment on the upper right-hand side, there's a variety of different things there. Uh, it's both uh, environmental and common marine environment. So we look at things like wake impacts for the confined waterways where, where um, wakes, uh, uh, look, looking at studying and, and, and vessel design associated with wake impacts, uh, operating passenger line ferries in, the, in an environment where there's marine mammals and, and the noise associated with the, the vessels that, and the impacts on marine mammals, sensitive shoreline vegetation. And then uh, lastly, in terms of emissions, looking at air quality aspects as well. And then finally, uh, equity is a, is a growing and, and increasingly important uh, component of planning and transportation planning in, our, in the Puget Sound region, central Puget Sound region, as well as other parts of the study area. So uh, we uh, thought it was important to really highlight uh, equity in, in our planning uh, for passenger only ferry. Uh, and that includes in community engagement. And so the concept there is making sure that uh, people who've been traditionally disadvantaged uh, in, um, are incorporated into the community engagement. So you're not planning an, a, a service for people, but including them in the planning of, the, of those services and making sure their voices are heard in the planning and implementation of the service. Secondly, uh, passenger only ferry has, uh, as well as other ferries tends to have a, a higher uh, fare than, than other types of uh, land-based transit. So making sure there's opportunity for uh, low-income fares, well, such as the Orca lift is an example in our central Puget Sound region. So ensuring that, that that's considered and part of the implementation as well as, as an important aspect. And with that, I think that covers the cross-regional findings. Or is this a point where we're gonna take uh, questions, Kristen? Yep, we're gonna pause here for questions. Okay. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions at this point in the webinar, please feel free to post those in the chat. And then as mentioned earlier, there's gonna be a few more points throughout the webinar um, if you'd like to hold off as well. I see a comment about Washington Mar Maritime Blue. So, uh, so that's uh, great. Uh, just for people to know, you can, you can also just see comments in the chat, but uh, if we don't have any questions, we can just keep rolling uh, down here and, and uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for that later on. Um, actually, a couple questions just came in here um, from Peter Phillips. Can you speak more about uh, Orca Lift or Orca Lit? I'm assuming oh, Lo Lo Orca Lift. Uh, yeah, so Orca Lift is a is a program um, for the uh, most of the transit agencies in the Central Puget Sound. Uh, provides a, a, a reduced fare for low income individuals who uh, qualify for that. So again, that would be an opportunity for uh, Orca Lift or, or, or a similar type of a program would allow for a reduced fare for low income individuals uh, being able to then use that, that uh, form of public transportation or more easily use that form of public transportation. Great. And then a question from Forrest Allison, uh, will passenger ferries be able to use existing ferry docks? And maybe Kristen, you can, I think the answer there is it depends, right? So maybe Kristen, you can answer that. Yeah, so that would definitely need to be something that is in an implementation phase where you seek out and um, create agreements um, and secure those agreements to use existing facilities. But there's certainly interest in our engagement about um, making certain facilities available. And there's also been concerns about using some existing um, infrastructure. So it's mixed, it depends on the route, and there's lots to still be done on that regard um, in implementation. And Kaylin, I see uh, Doug uh, Levy uh, has uh, asked a question. I think, Doug, your questions are related to the specific routes and the route profiles and estimates on ridership. I think uh, I'll recommend that we get to those when we go to the route profile section, which is later in the presentation. Great. And then uh, just one follow up, if you can speak to uh, who funds Orca Lift or how is that funded in any way? I, I think the transit agency's budget for that, uh, right? Uh, that this is similar to you know fare setting for the tra different transit agencies, and so uh, if um, they set their fares at different rates, and and uh, so that's part of the um, part of the agency's uh, budget. So for the local taxes and things like that go into um, subsidizing the, the, the fares, I believe. Great, I think that's all the questions so far. And Doug, if you have to cut out early, we can um, 
provide this information after the webinar and it'll be posted online um, so you can view it in its entirety as well. Uh, actually, one more uh, question has came in here. Um, over a million visitors visit Olympic National Forest every year. Are co carbon offsets taken into account in this study? So um, this study did not assess offsets. Um, the one thing that the study did do is look at emissions of um, profiled routes. So many of the routes did not um, lend themselves to electrification per current technology, although we're hoping that Maritime Blue can help with their research there. Um, but what it did do is identify what the current diesel um, typical emissions were and how that relates to bus and um, single occupancy vehicles. Great, I think that's all the questions we have so far, so we can catch some more at the, the next stopping point. Okay, thanks, Kaylin. All right, so we're moving on um, to our approach for the study and then some more findings after this. Um, a quick note that this is our third webinar. So the first and second webinars have a lot more information about steps one, two, and even step three. Um, we're kind of reporting out on this further analysis bit, but also trying to give a, a broad overview of the rest of the approach of the study to date. But again, if you do want more information, you can find that in the appendices and also in past webinars. But generally, um, the scope was so wide in the geographic area that in order to narrow it down to identify um, routes to to look at more detailed, there really had to be this stepped approach where we could kind of see which ones had more obstacles than others and how to, to pick those that we would focus a little more carefully on. And so um, what we did is we did a stepped approach where we first looked at confined waterways and land use compatibility. A second step, which was really informed by our public survey um, that looked at time savings and community interest, which were two of the highest um, Time travel savings was one of the highest priorities in every region. And then step three, where we looked at a variety of criteria, um, 10 total, to identify um, challenges, obstacles, and also opportunities um, for the varying routes. This next slide, wait for my computer to catch up, here we go. Um, the next slide kind of shows you that, you know, we started with 45 routes and I really don't expect you to be able to read this small um, graphic here on the left. It is in the report, but basically it's the list of all 45 that we started with. And you can see how as we moved through this stepped analysis, um, some moved forward and some did not, just based on um, initial review and then step two of what types of things we looked at, time travel savings and what we compared it to, what type of mode. Um, and then step three, just really high level here is the ranking in which it received. Um, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about that in the next slide, which shows our step three findings, but just generally this stepped approach took us from 45 down to 36 to step three, which had 18 routes. And all 18 of those routes do have a lot of information that was um, reviewed as part of them. And they can actually be found um, in the appendix of the report. It's, um, let's see here, it is Appendix D. So we have little mini profiles on all 18 routes. Then um, we had kind of two parts of this step three. We looked at all the different criteria and then we also had a community engagement or a stakeholder agency engagement um, to identify if we should move that one forward. And so um, we'll go through those findings in this next slide. Ultimately, it was seven routes that we reviewed in more detail. So this is ta the step three findings. You'll see on the top here, we had a higher, highest priority elements that were a higher um, weighted ranking and secondary priority elements. And you can see all 18 routes, which went through step three analysis. Time travel savings, it's kind of like a, a red light, green light scoring here. So you can kind of see very easily 
how things kind of shaked out. Um, so again, travel time savings was the big one. You'll see as an example, Fremont and South Lake Union did not show a travel time savings from the methodology that we used. Um, whereas Tacoma um, was, you know, more marginal or kind of on par, comparable, but yet still savings. And then Suquamish, Seattle, Bellingham, Friday Harbor, one of the highest with, I think, about 90 minutes of travel time savings from that direct route based on um, a single occupancy vehicle. Then we looked at um, existing commute demand, potential commute demand based on census and other um, community survey data, support criteria, which looked at existing plans and policies in place that identify um, a desire for passenger only ferry or enhanced ferry connections, as well as survey and stakeholder outreach results. Um, modal connection quality. So we looked at both the number of connections provided at that nearby um, landside connection and the quality of those. So where can you go? How many places can you go? And then the secondary priority elements included um, relative recreational potential and those were for our recreational routes only. So you can see that only four of those received that. And that was just relative based on those, not saying that you know, of course, Port Townsend has great recreational demand, but in comparison, we just compared it to each other. And then um, resiliency was another one where we looked at whether or not it had a bridge or ferry only connection or a transportation resiliency like a, an additional or an alternative to the I-5 corridor or the 405 corridor. And then the last one here is seaworthiness, where you'll see where if there was any, um, any route that had an extended area with higher currents or um, any kind of sea states that might have a less comfortable ride, then we identified those. And so you'll see how the rankings kind of came out. And really, we used this just to be able to give us information about what we would, what we would look into in even more detail. Again, very limited um, schedule and scope. So we had to make sure that we were getting as much information as we could and um, you know, being able to kind of narrow it down and get more focused. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. So ultimately, um, you, can, you can see here that we had basically four route profiles, but the Lake Washington Lake Union route profile is kind of, this one's special because it gets, <laughs> it gets four in itself. And um, the reason that we did that is we really wanted to be able to look at all the lake routes together um, and to be able to kind of compare them and they have very similar, um, you know, en ending potential and route profiles. So we looked at them together. Okay. So I think I'm gonna just go over these key assumptions and then we're gonna pause for questions. And I see a bunch have come in. So let me get through this one and then we'll head over to questions. Um, and so after this slide where we're talking about key assumptions, we're gonna go into the route profiles. The route profiles, just like they are on the PDF document on um, online is there is about four pages per each profile. Um, and so we're gonna be going almost exactly the same. So you can follow along with us if you want on the document. Um, and the, the draft plan itself provides a lot more information as to the assumptions and how to read these profiles. But just a couple, just for clarity before we get into them, is that um, for there's one discretionary route, which is the Bellingham Friday Harbor route. The rest are commute, um, identified routes. And for the commute routes, the assumption was three round trips for each peak, for the AM peak and the PM peak commute period. For the discretionary route, there's a seasonal and periodic trips. So that's a six month period, um, seven day a week for four trips a day. Uh, another key assumption is while we did identify some opportunities for um, an additional point, this is all point to point service. We just didn't have enough. Um, it was too much to look at so many different permutations. So we just focused on point-to-point -point service. 
Travel times, slowdown zones, maneuvering time is all added into our um, travel time. And um, there are approximate travel times where we compare to an existing competing mode. And that competing mode, as explained in previous webinars, depends whether you're in urban or a non-urban area, whether it was transit or car. Um, another key assumption is the ridership estimates. And um, I am by no means a modeling expert, but I will just have you all know that um, we did use the Soundcast as our baseline for all the commute trips within the PSRC region. It has a 2018 base year, um, assuming a startup service. So, you know, there's a lot has changed since 2018, as we all know. And so they're definitely, you know, the ridership isn't perfect, but it is using the best available data that we had. Um, we also know that there may be some um, additional induced demand as Gil spoke to earlier that stakeholders had um, voiced some concerns about, and that's certainly true, um, although was not modeled as part of this study. Um, costs, again, we're using our best known information and we do have, you know, really successful um, operators here in our region that we can call on for that information. Um, and it includes operating costs only. So there's a lot of funding uh, that will be needed for this type of service. Revenue was not calculated. Um, and also keeping in mind that the capital costs, while we do identify potential vessel costs in the draft plan, um, there's a big range of what a terminal cost may be. Um, and that really depends on what kind of landing you make it. Is it a, is it a terminal? Is it a multi-route um, hub? Is it just one landing? So that's really a wide range. And there's lots of different permutations of that as well, whether you need um, lease acquisition and the level of improvement. So with that, I will pause for questions. Yeah, so we'll start with a question from Christine Wolf. Um, can you speak to why Tacoma's resiliency score was so low and perhaps what went into to scoring resiliency overall? Sure. Right, so resiliency, um, we looked at ferry and bridge connections and high congestion areas. So um, we do have the I-5 listed on here, but I'm not seeing it on this. How about I, um, while we take the next question, I can kind of look into that, Kalen. Does that work okay? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's something we okay. can follow up with. Um, then a question from Forrest Allison. Uh, how was recreational utility tourism assessed slash tourism assessed? Okay, that one's going to be my question too. Okay, so... Um, some of these we may have to, if they're specific to like a data point, we might have to just save them to the end so that I can look and answer those questions. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that one, Kaylin? Which one? Yeah, so uh, how was recreational utility slash tourism assessed? And then kind of a follow-up, wouldn't Bellingham, Friday Harbor, and Bellingham, Orcas, and Lopez likely be an aggregate route with multiple stops? And was that considered in the assessment of a cost benefit of the route? Right, so the, um, the recreational potential was really taken from um, information of hotel rooms and current ferry traffic to those areas and also the walk shed and the availability of services within a walk shed of the ferry terminal. And um, if you would like more information um, you can visit the ridership appendix of the report that details um, the entire methodology for both commute and recreational ridership. And if you have it on hand, could you provide a link or um, some more information on where the details on the assumptions slash profile and scoring system for the Des Moines Southworth option? Um, J.C. Harris from Des Moines City Council only sees appendices for step three. So that might be something we can follow up directly afterwards as well. 
And maybe that is, uh, this is Gil, uh, just maybe that is just kind of like a reference to the, uh, that information is in the appendices, uh, the information on the detailed scoring for the uh, step three analysis in particular, I think is that what, what's being referenced here. Um, yeah, so um, specifically for Des Moines and Southworth, that information should be in the step three um, appendice. So if you open it up, you'll see the scorecard first. And then if you scroll through, you should see little mini profiles, which are, you know, half pagers for each of those that were the 18 profiles in step three. All right, and then a question from Kevin Bagwell, was induced demand a factor in the analysis? So this one's a tricky one to answer. And so Gil, save me if I, <laughs> if I don't I'll help. I'll say help. it quite right. But as, as I understand it, is that the downcast model does account for you know, some choices that people make or changing of those choices and priorities. What I don't believe that it considers is maybe something like we've seen happen in Remerton or even in Kingston where people are actually moving somewhere because of a service. So it takes exist, like the existing framework of people and population and where they go for jobs and they may make different decisions. It's not accounting for people changing, um, you know, kind of entire residences and things like that. And I'll just jump in to add in. I think that was a great answer, Kristen. Uh, just maybe this, the thing point I'd like to make is I, when we talk about writer's sub estimates, it's right, shown right here. We're talking about the 2018 base year. We used our Soundcast activity-based model for the PSOC region. Then there was a similar uh, methods used for those uh, routes outside. But it, it, this is part of the uh, a data-based, uh, fact-based neutral um, uh, analysis that we did, you have to make a choice at some point, right? And we're, we're kind of in the context of the uh, it, things are changing with the pandemic. Uh, uh, PSOC has a, a, a model base year of 2018. So that's, that's, we can use some observed data, some, some uh, information from, uh, from the past there to provide that. Uh, and it, it's probably a, a conservative estimate, but it's better to have a conservative estimate than to have an over, overly optimistic estimate. We could have done lots of different things. We could have gone to a 2040 estimate, but we'd have to add in all sorts of additional things, uh, potential you know, uh, routes like link light rail extensions and things like that. So, so we kind of used a, we came, came up with a method as shown here and as described by Kristen, and we, and we use that. It doesn't include the developments that have occurred since 2018. So it's 2020, there's things that have happened. It doesn't include things that are going to happen next year. Uh, so, so, so it's just, just to kind of uh, make sure everyone's clear about our ridership estimates that, that that's kind of the things that are included or not included. So I hope that helps. And then possibly one more here before we move on. Um, question from Peter Phillips. How can we as local stakeholders work to integrate stops between point to point? For example, Des Moines is about midway between Seattle and Tacoma. With uh, a charging station there, the Gloucester Beaker Fastfoil might be able to use it to recharge, and we have the demand. Right. So I think that, um, you know, and Gil, you mentioned this too, and I know you're going to mention it again in our conclusions, is that it was the hope that the, the work with this study would really give a lot of information to folks that want to move forward, local implementers. So while your route in particular may not be profiled, there's still a lot of rich information that you can use this as a reference point. So while we don't, um, you know, Peter, you, you bring up some, some opportunities that, you know, we didn't look at that, but it, um, hopefully you can use a lot of the work that we've done to help inform future work. And maybe before we go on, uh, um, Kristen, I was thinking about uh, Christine Wolf's question, and I think uh, on the on the resiliency aspect. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but those were really kind of higher scores were for the the island-based communities, those that were had like a a major bridge aspect. So Tacoma, uh, it's I five congestion is one aspect of it, but really, I think if you got higher scores, it was more the island or bridge-based kind of communities, right? Is that true? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And and whereas Tacoma has other other like they have commuter rail, they have some other alternative services. So so um, certainly, I mean, I five congestion is one aspect, but it doesn't have a major bridge or or a, a, like an island community. Correct. Okay. So you'd mentioned that uh, sidebars might be included in the final study to address interim stop potential. Will that appear? Yes. Um, yeah, if you're looking uh, for the Des Moines 
connection potential, and you'll see it when we come into the route profiles here in the next section, is that that's called out in the route profiles. And it's true of the Bellingham Friday Harbor route as well, where there was a lot of interest in an Orcas connection. So again, we didn't profile that, um, but we do identify in the, in the route profile itself mention that there was interest in that. You're welcome. Great, yeah, I think that's the questions we have so far. Okay, now for the good stuff. What you've all been waiting for, route profiles. And again, you can um, follow along. This is all in the report. So first off, let's talk about Tacoma, Seattle. Um, so again, you know, as we go through these, you'll see that they're all set up in the same way. Um, we have our operating profile identified here. This is a commute um, identified service um, with hourly departures, three in the AM peak and three in the PM peak. Um, it has a top service speed of 35 knots, so it needed, needs to go fast to be time competitive. We did account for slowdowns in our total POF trip time, which you can see at the bottom here. You can see the different comparable modes. Um, there is a slowdown, a slight slowdown in Commencement Bay, and then an even slower, um, slower slowdown um, in the Foss Waterway itself. Because of the trip time of 55 minutes, uh, in this route profile, we identified that the service would need two vessels operating um, during those peak periods with two, you know, two vessels, two separate crews, um, and one backup vessel to maintain the resiliency of that service. The um, comparative mode here, there's, you know, the sounder that you can take for a similar time frame and the express bus at 70 minutes. So the time savings varies a little bit there. Um, a closer look at the landing site locations. For this particular study, um, the 11th Street dock was identified through um, agency engagement. A previous Tacoma study had identified several other landing locations that could be potentials and that's still the case. Um, for this particular study, we focused in on 11th Street to be able to identify a point to have our route profile so we could do proper costing and um, ridership, etc. The 11th Street dock does need improvements. Um, how we identify different capital improvements in the plan is retrofits or new builds, which have, again, a range of um, cost. There's pretty good connections up here at 11th Street. Um, they have the, the elevator that can take you up and right over down into downtown Tacoma. Of course, you all know that the Seattle waterfront, once you get to the other side, um, is a little more challenging. There is not one specific um, location identified. So instead, the approach of this report, like in um, Lake Union as well is that there's, we've just identified all the different in water structures at the Seattle waterfront, I, knowing that additional analysis will need to be done to identify capacity for a future route. All with different varying levels of investment and environmental and engineering required. And also that there's different multimodal connection capabilities or, you know, pluses and minuses there with where you land on the waterfront. Okay, so then um, the way the route profiles work is then you have ridership, you have costs, and then we have sections um, really briefly on environmental and resiliency. The electrification potential is low here again because of speeds. Um, the ridership, we've identified daily riders and annual ridership. To give you some perspective there, just wanted to cite the existing um, Kitsap Fast Ferry route. Um, Kingston, Seattle has 175,000, give or take, of 2019 annual ridership, whereas the um, Vashon Island to downtown Seattle, King County Water Taxi Service, approximately 257,000 annually. West Seattle downtown, approximately 440,000, and the Kitsap 
fast ferry Bremerton to Seattle at around 300,000 annual. For cost summary for each of these routes, and again, there's a financial um, appendix that goes into more detail about the assumptions. But we have annual operating costs, which are in the thousands here rolled up, operating labor, that's you know basically crew time, energy or fuel, in this case it's fuel, um, diesel, and um, maintenance, insurance or other, and then management support and overhead because you know it, it does take a lot of um, time and management to get these um, get these services running. And so Tacoma is the one that has the highest fuel costs and that is because of the length of the route and the number of vessels that are operating, um, length and speed. And fuel cost is, you know, kind of volatile. So it's one of those aspects where if, um, you know, fuel gets more expensive, these costs will really increase. Whereas if there's different types of um, technology that can lower fuel costs, then that would be helpful for this route. Um, the resiliency, there, it is an alternative to the I-5 corridor and as all of these routes would be contributing to system redundancy. Um, so these environmental and resiliency ones are, are fairly similar. So I'll just try in the future on um, next route profiles to just identify where things might be a little bit different. Um, so I will be uh, explaining these first couple slides and then I'm going to turn it over to Gil and Gil you're going to speak to the community outreach that we heard and some of the overall hurdles and opportunities for Tacoma. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, as we, I think we mentioned in the uh, public engagement early, uh, earlier on, we did, uh, for each of these routes that were identified for route profiles, we did uh, engage with the uh, communities where the uh, potential host terminals would be located. In this case, we talked uh, to stakeholders in Tacoma, Ruston, and Seattle, and uh, particularly with locating at the downtown Seattle uh, location. Uh, the community outreach uh, results are shown in, in the, uh, the purple bar at the top there. And I think just to kind of acknowledge that this is uh, one of the ones that's identified here in those in those uh, bubbles, it's kind of uh, those circles are showing kind of the range of uh, support this route received from the different areas. And I think this is one of the routes that received uh, a great deal of uh, support from uh, the, the survey in spring from not just from uh, this region, but from other regions in the study area. So, so that was one of the things that was noted there. Uh, from the community outreach, just kind of noting a couple of things here, uh, the, the acknowledgement of uh, this provides an opportunity to connect a, a variety of different areas in downtown Tacoma, some of the, some of the uh, districts and, and uh, Prairie Line Trail and some connections that are nearby to that terminal. Uh, we also noted that uh, even though 11th Street Dock was an identified in a previous study, there was a uh, Ruston, town of Ruston option. So we did talk to the town of Ruston and that continues to be a potential viable option to look at. Uh, uh, it would obviously change some of the, the details of this route profile, but, uh, uh, but it would be something that could be looked at if, if 11th Street Dock uh, was not available. Uh, Kristen already mentioned that uh, the Seattle landing and the, and the uh, I, I need for a capacity there. There was uh, in discussion with Seattle opportunities for uh, some discussion around a variety of different uh, options. And I think that's uh, covered with what was shown in terms of the potential landing opportunities there. But I think in the Seattle discussions, there was also um, discussion of some of the further afield uh, landing opportunities up by Expedia and things like that for passenger only ferry in general. Uh, so just kind of reinforcing the need for uh, looking at uh, the downtown Seattle um, terminal and terminal capacity. Uh, also, there's a note, uh, note, note for uh, um, acknowledging uh, competing modes that, that uh, Tacoma to Seattle also, there's Sounder commuter rail now, there's uh, uh, in the future, there'll be um, link light rail. And so, so some competition for, for dollars, uh, for transit dollars in, in, in between passenger only ferry and these other types of uh, land-based transit. Um, hurdles and opportunities, just in summary, um, we already talked uh, about the landing capacity limitations in downtown Seattle, I won't add to that. Uh, Kristen mentioned low potential for electrification with current technology on this route in particular. And then, and so I think those have all been well covered. Uh, and then I think actually uh, just noting for opportunities that there was a previous feasibility study, a partnership with the city of Tacoma, uh, Pierce Transit and Port of Tacoma, and then Kitsap Transit's existing uh, uh, siding study for the Seattle terminal siding study. As I mentioned earlier, that's going on. And then there is that sidebar, uh, Kristen was mentioning in response to Peter Phillips about uh, uh, City of Des Moines recent study. That study had uh, occurred, uh, I think it started and ended, uh, it started after we started our work and, and ended before we ended our work, uh, but they developed a, 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 um, 
a passenger only ferry uh, feasibility study for uh, the D Des Moines uh, terminal, D Des Moines um, Marina, and looking at that uh, potential uh, in that area. So just acknowledging that, and that could be a, an interim stop for the Tacoma to Seattle uh, route. Uh, did I miss anything, Kristen? Is there anything else you wanted to cover on this? I don't think so. And okay, I, I think the study was more of a market assessment. For the Des Moines one. Feasibility. Okay. Okay. Seeing some questions in the chat and it's hard to resist. I'm resisting answering them, but they're good ones. Okay, let's move on to Bellingham Friday Harbor and we'll get to your questions here soon. Okay, so this of the four, you know, route profiles, this is the, um, you know, discretionary service that was modeled, um, again, as a template for other discretionary um, types of routes that may be out there for implementers to want to implement. This uh, route of the routes that we profiled had the highest um, time savings. Um, it's pretty pretty high there with a 50 minute passenger only ferry ride. Um, this route profile is different than all of the others as it was a seasonal service with four round trips a day. Um, it again is a, a 35 knot vessel that was um, modeled and it does include slow down zones at the Friday Harbor Marina entrance and of course the um, maneuvering time at either ends of the of this route. The fleet here is just one service vessel and one backup vessel. And um, I think that's about it for this one. So the different landing site locations, both showing retrofits, really there's, there are um, landing sites there that could be used with some minor improvements. Um, and that is actually one of the reasons why there's opportunity here for some maybe pilot service. Um, the senior, or the, I'm sorry, the, the sites here, you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but there's excellent um, connections. And I think that the city of Bellingham is um, improving those bike connections even more. It is a bit of a walk from this um, Fairhaven Station, but once you're here, you do have a lot of opportunities for multimodal connections. Um, Friday Harbor, if many of you have been there, also has many connection opportunities, a small, um, lots of walkability, let's put it that way. Okay. So estimated ridership, again, this is for six months of service. And so, you know, Numbers are fairly low here. We've had a lot of feedback about um, how many anecdotally people think that there's a lot more ridership than this. And that could certainly be true, but using our methodology, this is the numbers that we found. Um, operating costs, you'll see this energy and fuel is quite a bit lower than Tacoma. That's for a number of reasons, um, essentially the, the seasonal service, because it is a, a fairly long route, just like Tacoma with high speeds. And um, resiliency was a big difference in this one is, is that, you know, this is a ferry dependent community. We heard from stakeholders that access to mainland medical facilities and other services was very important. Um, they have a local, you know, medical facility there, but not one with more beds and some specialty services that are needed. Okay, Gail, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. So uh, I think this one, uh, I just kind of noting that this is really did have a really high um, amount of community support, particularly in uh, that, that Northern counties. Uh, so that's shown kind of here in the, in the bottom with the community outreach information. Uh, just noting, um, I think some of the community outreach information we heard uh, talking to uh, San Juan County and, and Whatcom County, Bellingham folks, uh, there's a great opportunity and potential for day trips, uh, particularly looking at like, uh, I guess on both ends, but I think what we were hearing in particular was from Whatcom County and Bellingham going out to uh, the San Juan Islands, uh, financial feasibility, the importance of that, and particularly as we're looking at this as a, uh, as a um, seasonal kind of a route. Um, the 
reliability aspects and, and being able to be another option for uh, uh, com uh, for the island de dependent communities that are dependent upon Washington State ferries. Uh, there, this was also another uh, route, as Kristen mentioned, that where there would be a highlight for a or a sidebar for um, potential additional stops. We could probably have done these for all, all the routes uh, because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, there's a great deal of interest in this. And, and uh, but I think this option was for uh, um, Bellingham to Friday Harbor with a potential stop at Orcas Island. Uh, it was one of the ones that was br brought up by the San Juan County folks. And then again, bicycle connections and space on vessels is important, uh, in particular in this one and brought up in, in some of the community outreach. Uh, I think uh, some of these things were covered by Kristen, so I won't uh, uh, belabor them too much in terms of hurdles and opportunities, but this is one of the, uh, this route had more open water. So the sea states was a, a potential hurdle there, as well as the low projected ridership. And then the opportunities there uh, mentioned the community interest already. Economic development opportunity. This is one area where it's seen as a, a potential opportunity for uh, inducing demand and bringing people to the, the islands and, and, and uh, bringing people from the islands to Bellingham. Um, I think one thing to note, uh, potential pilot service. I can't remember if you mentioned this, uh, Kristen, but uh, this is uh, one place where the uh, terminal facilities on both ends are there's some existing infrastructure that could be used so it would allow for an opportunity to uh, do a pilot service uh, using that existing infrastructure and, and seeing how the service does and, and using that as a pilot, uh, pilot project. And then uh, an opportunity to kind of align with the uh, upcoming regional plan updates in Whatcom County. Uh, I, in particular, I think with that was where that uh, opportunity came from. And then, uh, and then uh, starting off as a, uh, I think the last one here is it's an opportunity uh, starting it off as a uh, seasonal is, is fine as a starter service. As we mentioned, we kind of did this as a universally across the board starter service, but there was interest and potential for year round service uh, and, and the idea of being able to get people from the islands to Bellingham to doctor's appointments and other things like that was, was uh, one of the things that was noted there. Um, turning back over to you, Kristen, unless you have something else to add. That was great. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to answer one of the questions that I see in the chat about passenger capacity on the vessels, because I feel like that's important to know as we go through these profiles. Um, what we have listed, you can see kind of the maximum passenger per vessel. This um, profile in particular would be Everett, um, was the only route that we profiled on the Puget Sound waters that had a smaller vessel. Um, the other routes, Tacoma and the Bellingham route that we just went through, we were assuming a kind of platform, if you will, of a 250 um, passenger vessel, although it doesn't need to be outfitted for that many actual passengers. So it's more for um, kind of combating sea states and making sure it's a comfortable ride, um, but it doesn't need to have that many seats and it also could accommodate, you know, bicycles and those kind of things. Okay, so would be Everett. This one is one of the shorter routes um, with 20 minutes from, um, of trip time from terminal to terminal. We did account for the slowdowns at Jetty Island. Would be a fast 35 knot speed, but does have a, a smaller vessel. Excuse me, I need my water break. <laughs> okay, this is also another commute service operating profile with 3 a.m. and 3 p.m. trips and with just one service vessel. So, oh, excuse me. So the Everett site, mm -hmm. I think you should take over for a second here, Gil. <coughs> okay, yeah, sure. Um, maybe I'll just uh, start uh, off a little bit with they're talking about the different uh, landing, potential landing locations here. Uh, we're looking at the in Clinton uh, terminal. There's the Washington State Ferries terminal there, and there's a uh, existing uh, passenger only ferry landing site uh, that uh, was used at the representative location there. Um, feel free to jump back in when you're ready, Kristen. Uh, yeah, let's see okay. how my voice does. Okay, <laughs> okay. so um, so this this one's interesting. It is <coughs> excuse me, right next to the Clinton um, terminal. <clears throat> 
And the um, Everett site is at the Port of Everett. And while it's not right next to the new pedestrian bridge, it is within close-ish proximity and does have parking right there as well. There are some kind of exciting new developments in Clinton. Um, Washington State Ferries has just recently um, completed a kiss and ride drop-off location there. And um, there's some other kind of pretty good multimodal connections. There's parking, there's a island shuttle service, so. And on the Everett side, uh, that, that was the one that needed some additional transit connections, right? And there's a, it's a rather, rather large, long walk to the bus stop, but uh, some potential improvements could be made from the Everett transit feedback that could be made to kind of make that better in the future. Yeah, exactly. Improvements that could be made um, and also in our jurisdictional outreach with Everett Transit, mm -hmm. identifying that those, yep. if that could happen and they'd be willing to do that if this um, service was implemented. Okay, so for the ridership, this is, you know, there's lower numbers for this service. Um, and electrification potential is actually pretty high for this one. And this is the highest of any of the routes that we profiled due to the short trip um, and presence of, you know, electrification or of um, electricity on either side. Um, annual cost, you'll see those here. You'll see a representation here in the energy and fuel costs, again, very different than you saw in Tacoma, Seattle. And this is another, you know, resiliency, very dependent, bridge dependent community. So the system, transportation system redundancy and access to um, the mainland is, is important to these communities. Okay, and, yeah, so here we go to the community outreach and the hurdles and opportunities for the South Whidbey to Everett. Uh, uh, this actually, this, this route had kind of uh, a lower amount of uh, support across the different regions. So you'll see lower numbers there in those, uh, in the bubbles kind of the, at the community outreach uh, call out. Uh, but it still did uh, rise to the, uh, the level of, uh, in terms of the top half of those step three routes. So uh, eligible for this uh, route profile. Uh, we did reach out to uh, various stakeholders in the South Whidbey uh, Island area, uh, Island County and and the port of uh, um, South Whidbey and place like that. Uh, we talked to uh, uh, different stakeholders in the Everett area, Port of Everett, uh, City of Everett, Everett Transit. Um, so some of the uh, feedback we heard in terms of that community outreach, again, there's um, uh, opportunity to provide uh, uh, more connections to the mainland, particularly for Whidbey Island and kind of reflecting that uh, additional resiliency aspect. This is uh, Whidbey Island being both, it has a ferry and a, a bridge connections, uh, but uh, this uh, provides an additional opportunity, additional, additional uh, connection for that, those communities in South Whidbey Island. Uh, we already mentioned the transit access in Everett, uh, kind of the existing conditions and the potential for some future improvements in that area. If this did become a, 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 a reality of a, of a route and some work with Everett Transit and uh, other stakeholders to kind of be able to improve that connection. Uh, Kristen already mentioned the, uh, the ride share opportunity there, the additional ride sp share space that was provided at the Clinton Washington State Ferry Terminal. It could be used for, for this passenger only ferry. In terms of parking, um, uh, there was some uh, limited parking availability on both sides of the route. Uh, there is parking there, but uh, uh, it kind of limits to those availability. Uh, and then uh, I think that the uh, stakeholders here noted, uh, you know, governance and who would be operating this. Uh, uh, I think this is actually kind of something, again, we didn't address governance specifics in the uh, study itself, but again, that would be something that there's a lot of different eligible entities. So there'd be some, need some work among the different potential stakeholders to identify who would be the entity that would be uh, providing this service, implementing it. And then uh, final thing on the community outreach uh, is noted that uh, the uh, proximity to the Navy and U.S. Coast Guard facility and opportunity for people uh, who uh, live, uh, who work at the Navy and U.S. Coast Guard who live on Whidbey Island, being able to use that to be able to get a very proximate uh, uh, destination there uh, on the Everett side. Uh, so that would be a really good uh, commute potential for those those um, locations. In terms of hurdles, uh, I won't go into, again, already mentioned the Everett Transit connection aspect and the low projected ridership would be the hurdles here. Uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, Kristen already mentioned the potential for electrification. 
uh, the opportunity to align with the Clinton uh, uh, Ferry Terminal redevelopment and uh, being able to improve the uh, Passenger Line Ferry Dock there. Um, there's also some opportunity here for uh, some partnerships, uh, potential uh, partnership with a private operator. Uh, it could be a, uh, another opportunity for a potential pilot study since uh, at least on one side of, uh, there's a, a good terminal location. And then also there's the Hat Island in between uh, Whidbey Island and Everett and Hat Island has a private ferry service. So again, we, we didn't get into multiple stops for these. We were a, a point A to point B uh, route analysis, but uh, given the proximity to Hat Island and some of the ex interest expressed in a, uh, from Hat Island uh, stakeholders at one of the early meetings, that could be an opportunity there as well. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Kristen. Okay, thank you. Um, the last route we're going to profile is actually four routes, the Lake Washington Lake Union routes, which includes Kenmore to University of Washington is the location that we've chosen for this study um, through analysis, Kirkland, UW, Renton, UW, and Renton to South Lake Union. You'll see that they have varying um, POF travel times, which results in varying time saved based on the alternative mode of bus travel. This again is a commute service. So 3 a.m. peak and 3 p.m. peak trips, um, five days a week, with a top service speed of a little bit lower than that in Puget Sound of 28 knots. Slowdowns were accounted for in all of the POF travel times that you see below, um, which are rounded to the nearest five, just for, um, for ease here. But we considered the slowdown zone that from Webster Point all the way through to South Lake Union under the SR520 bridge and I-90 bridge. So for the two Seattle um, landing sites. We have the University of Washington, the Waterfront Activity Center. Um, that would be a replacement or a new build. There's no existing facilities there that um, could accommodate this service. Um, it's located within um, about a seven minute walk or so to the UW light rail station, which has great connections to downtown and up north, um, as well as the Burke Gilman Trail. Um, for South Lake Union, um, the representative point that we picked was South Lake Union Park to identify route profiles, but there is many facilities within um, a walkable uh, distance from the streetcar station, which is really where we identified. It's like, okay, if we want to get to the streetcar station, which of these docking facilities could you potentially use? Um, there's many private properties. We did not um, consult with any of those private properties. We did consult with the city of Seattle and hear their concerns um, and opportunities, which Gil can speak to in the next, um, the next couple slides. As far as the um, other lake community landing sites, we spoke with the city of Kenmore. There has been previous studies in Kenmore from uh, King County Metro. Uh, Lake Point was chosen as the site in Kenmore. It is currently not developed um, with redevelopment plans in the future and uh, a new facility would need to be built there. In Kirkland, Marina Park was the terminal location chosen after, um, after con consultation with the city there and it has pretty good connections. The Kirkland Transit Center is within a, a pretty flat walkable area with bus lines serving it in and out of the city. Um, city of Renton, the Southport location was chosen as the terminal location there from agency review. It's within a really, uh, there's improvements there all the time that are connecting to the rapid ride bus lines, um, as well as parking at a nearby park um, and that Southport development, which is continuing to develop. Okay, so um, here you can all see them kind of side by side is the projected ridership using our existing methodology. Um, 
I'm not sure if you recall my kind of comparative on existing services, um, but the Kingston to Seattle route in 2019 annual ridership was 175,000, give or take. So just to give you a kind of a, a sense for comparison. So the Kenmore and Kirkland certainly have higher ridership per our current methodology. Um, Renton to UW and, South Lake Union, and Renton to South Lake Union had lower ridership. And costs were very similar um, for all three of these locations with the exception of Renton to South Lake Union. And that's really um, due to, you know, the, the makeup of the trip. So because of the trip length and the time that it takes in order to get three round trips in the AM peak and three in the PM peak, you need to have two vessels in operation, which means two crews. So that's where your, your costs, um, operating labor costs are really a lot higher than these other routes, as well as management and support and insurance and maintenance, all those things are factors of operating hours. Resiliency and environmental, you know, uh, environmental permitting and evaluation would need to be done for any route to be implemented. Um, there are some resiliency aspects to um, giving these, you know, different bridge communities um, an alternative way in and out of downtown Seattle, although there are alternatives that exist, very different than, you know, some of our island communities. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, thank you, Kristen. Uh, talking a little bit about the community outreach we did for the Lake Washington Lake Union routes. Um, we did talk with the UW and uh, City of Seattle, uh, Seattle DOT, and Seattle Parks for Seattle side uh, landing areas. We did uh, have meetings with the communities uh, Kirkland, Kenmore, and Renton, and, and some stakeholders from all those communities for the uh, Lake Washington communities. So just to kind of uh, some of the uh, uh, top line feedback from those uh, Lake Washington communities, again, a diverse group, uh, Kenmore, Kirkland and Renton, uh, acknowledgement of some competition for transit dollars. Uh, I think as we just noted earlier, look the ridership, you know, the, the pros and cons of different times of doing the ridership by using 2018, I think there's been some bus uh, changes to bus ridership on the 520 bridge. And so I think in, that was kind of one of the comments coming from Kirkland in terms of the competition for different transit dollars, land-based as, as well as passenger only ferry. There's also with all the different um, communities there, there's both uh, challenges and opportunities with development. I think Kristen kind of covered some of that. Some of the, uh, you know, un, uh, Kinmore has a Lake Point development that hasn't been developed yet. But some opportunity there hasn't yet occurred. Seco development is in, um, in um, oops, uh, uh, I think you, uh, um, Seco development um, in, in Renton, um, that, that kind of uh, has already been developed and there's continuing to, to um, um, grow in that area. We have some opportunities, uh, first and last mile connections, I think was in particular mentioned in the Renton, uh, uh, as well as the equity were some of the ones that were uh, important in the Renton conversations. But equity is again, as mentioned earlier, uh, important throughout, but I think in Renton in particular, there was some discussion about the community uh, that would be using that route, uh, having some of the traditionally disadvantaged populations, uh, uh, communities of color in, the, in that area. Uh, Seattle side, there was some, uh, a uh, discussion about, uh, particularly with UW, there's the UW uh, crew operations and the, the uh, practice areas for the UW crew and the proximity to the, uh, the uh, potential terminal location there. In both Lake Union and uh, 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 Lake Washington, there was recreational craft and the uh, 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 amount of recreational craft uh, uh, travel in that area that, that uh, 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 discussion about what that would mean with a passenger only ferry going through there. Pedestrian connections, I think Kristen already mentioned that with respect to the UW and the connection between the light rail station and, and the uh, uh, representative terminal location uh, and, and the needs for uh, ADA uh, uh, access improvements and, and improvements to that uh, connection. Uh, also um, grant restrictions with respect to uh, park, park properties and, and uh, other um, you know, properties that, uh, that might be in, in play with the late South Lake Union. And then, um, and I think that covers that. Yeah, so onto the hurdles and opportunities. Uh, I think some of this is repeated from the before from the community outreach, so I won't go into that as much. But um, uh, just kind of looking again, I think there will be some uh, need to be a lot extensive coordination on the Seattle side for, uh, for all of these, whether it be, uh, to identify a location, whether it be UW, South Lake Union or another location. I think in the Kenmore, there was even some other locations brought up that we didn't study. Um, 
for the different uh, other um, opportunities. We had, uh, as you can see, some of the higher estimated ridership are on these uh, routes, as well as some of the ones uh, that have, um, that would be the Kenmore to, and Kirkland locations. Um, we had some higher travel time savings on Renton to UW. Um, uh, and then uh, let's see some, some, I think, I think this, uh, mo most of this has been covered in some of the yeah, uh, other, so. yeah. So thanks. Yeah. So we're getting really close to our time and I, we've, yep. I think we've done a pretty good job of incorporating our route findings within the route profile discussion itself. So I'm going to kind of blaze through those Gil okay. and just yep. tee us up for discussing um, and again, all of this is in the is in the draft report, and also we've mentioned it as we're talking through um, these route profiles. The one thing that I don't know if we've mentioned, but as it relates to you know management costs, efficiencies could be realized by partnering with an existing operator for implementation of these services, and that relates to management and also maintenance. Um, and then, Gil, I think if you can just hit this really briefly, then we can go to questions. Yeah, I think the main point here is that uh, we have this, uh, a lot of the steps that are identified at the end of the report are for local implementers. Again, this is kind of like, this is a planning feasibility study. And so you can see a lot of information in here uh, in, our, in our conclusions for local implementation, uh, particularly with respect to building a business and implementation plan, whoever that implementer might be, the locals. And then state, there has some opportunity. There have, they've already provided some uh, policy and funding opportunities for lo uh, locals to implement passenger only ferry. But there's, this, this study also provides some information for the state to use if they wanted to look at passenger only ferry in this larger Puget Sound context. Text. So I think that's enough to say on this slide. Uh, and at the next slide, I think we were just going to say um, that um, that uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we're just almost to the end of the study. And I just wanted to kind of like note out, I think we have a deadline. I think it's the next slide that, that we're talking about. Um, the study is due on by January 31st. So we're looking for feedback. The study is available on the on the on the website as shown here. You can provide your feedback to the study email address that's shown at the bottom. We uh, need that feedback by December 28th, and uh, and we're going to be summing it up to in, uh, include in that uh, public engagement, stakeholder engagement um, uh, part of the study. So yeah, I, I think you're a good call, Kristen. Let's uh, leave, turn it over to questions at this point. All right, so I have some questions queued up here. <clears throat> I think we'll start with some of the questions regarding the, the cost per trip. So given the cost per trip, how does this compare with other modes of transportation and the percentage of recapture from passengers? Who pays the shortfall? Right, so um, we did not do a full business plan for this study and you'll see in the conclusion section of the report that that is the next step. Um, for implementation is to figure out funding options and um, fair levels. And so, um, you know, there's different models for that. There's, you know, King County Metro and how they're funded through property tax and also the fare box. Um, and also there's Kitsap Transit that has a sales tax initiative and, um, and fare box with grants um, for capital investments. So just like any, most transit in the, in the region or in the country, it's subsidized in some way. And this study did not look at how to subsidize or to fund these trips, or even assuming that it's public only, there's still opportunities for, for private service as well. Great, and then for the Tacoma to Seattle route, um, is the 11th Street uh, location a public facility? Do you know who controls that? It's our understanding that it is um, owned by the city of Tacoma through um, the waterfront division, yes. Um, and then a question with regards to ridership, ridership projection. Um, this was asked for the Tacoma to Seattle route, but could be applied to any of them. Do the ridership projections consider future changes in dispersion of jobs versus housing and the changing nature of work post COVID? For example, folks living farther away from Seattle due to the high cost of living? Should I start with this one, Kristen, and then sure. maybe you can add on? I think I'm mean, just kind of repeating uh, our, our ridership. We're really we're looking at, you know, we had this challenge of starting this study and in, in the middle of it, we had the pandemic uh, hit, right? So 
would would it be useful to use 2020? Uh, uh, obviously not. Uh, so we had to make a decision. You know, are we going to use some kind of projected future? Are we going to use something that we have uh, some actuals on? Uh, you know, where are we going to go with this? And so uh, again, trying to be really you know uh, fact based, neutral. You know, we we thought a safest place to kind of go here was with using that 2018 base year. Uh, uh, so we know, you know, what the, the transit connections are, who uh, the development are, uh, and we can run that through our modeling. Uh, so it, in short, it didn't consider, and I think I saw a couple other questions, kind of, uh, how are we ac accounting for COVID? I think it's just, just part of our planning in this, in this era of uncertainty. We have uh, some big changes to our, for our transportation system. We at PSRC and our, in our long range regional transportation plan, we, we, we are planning for a transit focused growth strategy into the future. So long-term we think it's going to come back. Uh, 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 but, you know, for purposes of this study, we wanted to make sure we weren't, you know, overestimating or really providing wildly optimistic or, or overly pessimistic uh, um, um, uh, projections. So for ridership, we did choose that 2018 and we had to acknowledge that that's probably conservative. There's probably induced demand. There's been things that have happened since then. And I think, I hope that's kind of um, answers that and some other like COVID related questions that are out there. Great. <clears throat> and moving on to Bellingham to Friday Harbor, are the Harbor Sea states a year round condition or are they meaningfully less so in the spring slash summer season that the service is proposed for? The latter is true, yes. Great. And then similarly on the uh, Bellingham to Friday Harbor, um, is there any possibility of private um, operator partnerships on the Bellingham to San Juan route? So again, um, our, our report addresses this in a really high level is that there's, this information is intended to help whatever local implementer in whatever means. Um, and so I think the costs and the route profile, potential obstacles and hurdles can help with implementation or further study for whether it be a private or a public operator. So even, even costs are somewhat similar and that um, they can use those as a baseline to know where to go next. And maybe just apologies that we're, we're, we're really close to time, but I, I, I'm getting a message that we can go over a little bit if we need to. Uh, maybe we can uh, wrap this up at 3.05 if people are willing to stick around a little bit longer and we can maybe get through some of these questions. Great. So moving on to um, some of the questions related to Lake Washington, Lake Union routes. Um, with regards to the peak trip service, what is the anticipated separation of trips, uh, the time between vessel passing and each commute segment? Um, hourly. It was hourly service within the AM and PM peak. Okay. And um, with regards to um, the same route, how were the slowdown speeds determined? Um, it seems seven knots through the ship canal is fast. Um, they were determined via nautical charts and regulations on the water. So seven knots is five miles an hour. And then um, how do the Lake Washington routes score for electrification? Generally low um, or, you know, medium, I guess, in our uh, ranking. Um, and that's I think because of distance and length and also just not knowing if um, utility availability on either end. So, you know, at the UW Waterfront Activity Center as an example or the Kirkland Waterfront as another example. So um, a lot more can be done to look into the potential for that, especially as technology evolves. Great. And then um, I think the last one that we have here so far is can you go over the next step what the next steps might be again yeah i think i, I went over that r rather quickly so uh, uh, maybe uh, just to kind of touch on a little bit more in, de in depth is that uh, i think we kind of identify some things you know we are psc a regional transportation planning organization we like to see uh these kind of projects, uh, you know, we're looking at this at the feasibility level for this study. Uh, interested implementers would then kind of, if there, if there's some, uh, they think there's some legs to this, trying to get these into uh, regional plans, into the comprehensive plans, those types of things to be able to get that into the planning framework and be able to uh, 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 get working on that. 
I think some key steps are like who will be implementing the, the, uh, the route. You know, is it your public transit agency? Is there another? Is there a city that's interested in that? I mean, trying to identify the implementers, those that you need to coordinate with and starting to work together on a lot of the different things that are outlined in the study. So I think if I were just kind of like to sum up in, in, in real detail, if you're a, a local and you're interested in one of these routes, uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, you'd be looking to do. And I think you would just, I would just direct you to the uh, conclusion of the, of the study to be able to see where that's outlined. Uh, feel free if you have additional questions to, to follow up. But again, we, we, you know, this wasn't an implementation study, so we were just trying to identify those opportunities and and um, and op, op, obstacles. And and I guess another thing being, if, if you do have one of those particular routes, you know, what are those opportunities? What are those obstacles? What are the things you need to work on to make that a route a reality? Um, is there anything to add, Kristen, for that, on, in terms of your perspective? I don't think so. Just that you know, kind of reiterating some of the things that we've heard in the chat um, and throughout this study is that there's you know, some of these bigger cross-regional um, findings about, you know, partnerships and um, opportunities. And, you know, each of these routes kind of starts in one jurisdiction and ends in another, not unlike transit service. So there's a lot of coordination um, in moving forward with any of these routes. Anything else, Kaylin? No, unless there's any late breaking questions here, I think that gets through for those that have been posted. And as mentioned earlier, there's uh, up on the screen is the POF underscore study at PSRC.org. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. Yes. And, and th thank you. Please provide us that feedback uh, by December 28th. And thank you all for your participation and for uh, listening in our webinar and uh, providing your feedback. Yes. Thank you very much. And to all of our stakeholders that have helped, you know, strengthen the information that's in all of these uh, route profiles, there was no way we could be on the ground at all of them. So we really appreciate your um, partnership. All right. With that, I think we're adjourned then. All right.